what I want you guys to think about with me, and I'm not um, really a historian of ideas, so I, I feel a lot less authoritative than other speakers I've seen in this like conversational series really does seem to be a conversation, which kept me very relaxed. But what I'd love for you to picture is a stoic working. <laughs> so when you picture a stoic working, I'd imagine one of the most common images we conjure up is someone working out <laughs> because of uh, recent recent trends. But then I would also imagine we picture, I'm here in Charleston, so once in a while I get to guest teach at the Citadel. So I imagine people in uniform uh, lined up. And then you might also picture someone reading in their study. And so I do want to suggest it's not perfectly clear what the Stoics have in mind when it comes to work or like the ideas we conjure up when it comes to a Stoic working. But there is no doubt about it, Stoics work. <laughs> so if I can quote Seneca, he says about the Stoics, surely you Stoics say right up to the end of life, we shall be in motion. We should not cease working for the common good, helping individuals, giving strength even to our enemies with our elderly hand. We are those who give no years to exemption from military service and as that most eloquent man said, we conceal our gray hair with a helmet. <laughs> we are among those for whom right up until death, there is no leisure so that if a circumstance is to be born, death itself would not be leisure. You know, how up for activity and challenging behavior a stoic is, is emphasized. And then I also just want to, you know, put on the table that stoics, you know, famously understand orders. And the example I want to give is of the order Eisenhower gave in, I think, 1955, the fighting man's code of conduct after there was some press about how it was kind of every man for himself in prisoner of war camps earlier. And so this was a suggestion. If I become prisoner of war, I will keep faith with my fellow prisoners. I'll give no information or take part in any action which will be harmful to my comrades. If I'm senior, I take command. If not, I will obey the lawful orders of those appointed over me and will back them up in every way. It seems very neutral, seems like a reasonable request, something we could live up to, something a Stoic wouldn't shy away from. But I want to use Vice Admiral Stockdale as an example of a modern Stoic understanding an order like this in just a moment. And my questions for us are, if you imagine the military march, is that a good depiction of Stoicism? How obedient are we? And then if you imagine someone working out, I want to remind us that that would have to be for a clear purpose. I sound confident about that, but Larry Becker puts it that way. You are responsible for your fitness to a level of excellence for a purpose. So you have to reason through why you're working out, have, a, I guess, a target, a goal, not do it for its own sake. And then the line about stoic leisure, not being every day, but having to involve study or it is death is really popular on the internet. So I've seen a lot of memes with that. I believe that's Seneca. And then I also want to suggest that a stoic suggests we need to be useful to others, even to our dying day. But there are also limits on the activity they expect of us. So one question Seneca handled was, isn't it better to lie around idle than to whirl around in eddies of business distraction is the translation I'm using. So not a compliment to business activity. And the response is both extremes are to be deprecated, both tension and sluggishness. And I think that makes the view seem complex if we're trying to pin down the stoic take on work. And then this is worse still. So this you might even want to revise if you're a modern Stoic. The standard motivations, according to Seneca, are not in play when we work because, as he tells us from his palace, in order to banish hunger and thirst, it is not necessary for you to pay court at the doors of the purse proud or to submit to the stern frown or to the kindness that humiliates. And so I want us to think about the realism of that, <laughs> realism being important to contemporary stoicism. And one of his lines is that if you've made a fair 
compact with poverty, if you've come to terms with the possibility of being poor, then you're rich. So he says, it's the superfluous things, the superfluous things for which we sweat. They're the ones that make us make our togas threadbare. They're the ones that force us to grow old in camp, which is such a contradiction to the idea that we wear helmets until our hair is gray. But these superfluous things are the reasons, the motivations we have to dash ourselves upon foreign shores. That which is enough is ready to our hands. So let me see if I can sum up what I think we have. Stoics know how to work. <laughs> if any of this is controversial, I, I, I'm open to that. Stoics know how to understand orders. Stoics can be expected to follow orders well, orders they understand. And then the third thing I still want to try and establish is that Stoics know how to quit or resist. And I'm going to use Stockdale as an example here. And then the questions I have that are active, do Stoics understand how to work under a boss who isn't virtuous? And do Stoics know how to work in a complex, demoralized organization like we tend to work in today? I mean, I think most of us still work in agriculture, but those of us who work in in offices, do we do we know how to do that in a stoic way? And then if you guys don't mind, I just want to push off the table a few ways of thinking about work that are incredibly interesting, but our jobs are a little easier if we agree they're not stoic. So they're really common ways of thinking about work, but not stoic, you know, say I. Individualism is my first example. And I feel this is a painful thing to jettison because we're very attached to individualism around here. And, you know, Emerson and Thoreau are big American heroes, but I just want to suggest individualism where your authenticity and like the origination of your ideas is are th that those are yours alone somehow is at odds with the kind of training and teaching that Stoicism uses as a, an example of a virtuous behavior. So like my children, for example, they're in a choir, a high church Episcopalian choir. And I always laugh, they are the opposite of self-taught. <laughs> so if you could imagine, you know, an iconoclast, some rebel going his own way, learning to play guitar and in, in, by himself, you know, doing it in his own way. I think Amy Winehouse uh, learned to play guitar in her own way. That's one model. But I think at least stoicism is capable of incorporating a very different model than individualism, where it is it is not a lesser thing to learn how to sing every note from someone else who learned it from someone else who learned from someone else and doing nothing original with it at all. <laughs> also, of course, climbing the ladder as success is not something the Stoics approve of, or, you know, as we saw Seneca put it, are, are even comfortable with, if we just leave that as a sort of tension with Seneca. But climbing the ladder to success will not make you happy no matter what you achieve. That's just not going to be the formula. And then very commonly, we take Weber's description of the work ethic, which was, you know, a sociological observation of something that motivated people when they were no longer associated with the religions that supported the work ethic, where you're really doing it for God. But I think we now take that to be an account of morality. And I just want to point out that that's distinct from Stoicism. So in a work ethic, Weber's original description, but you know it's still all over the place, uh, you work because you have a duty just to work. You work despite reward. Um, you get improved by being part of an organization. The more structured, longer lasting, the better. The work ethic, as Weber identified it, is against like spontaneous enjoyment of life. So being serious and you know wearing a, a suit, having an orderly office, all of these things improve you and keep you from losing track of yourselves. You have a real responsibility to your possessions in his original work ethic, and also they 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 had to be the right sort. There are some ethical components that you can still recognize from the outside. So dishonesty is frowned upon. Unbridled greed would be frowned upon. That would be very anti-system. And then, you know, there's some negatives where the distribution of jobs and resources is beyond questioning. So that is not for you to question if you have uh, Weber's work ethic. So if we disassociate those from stoicism, and, and if I can like disassociate one more thing, 
The idea that we are submitting our will to another seems pretty popular out there as if that is certainly something to avoid. And as I'm sure you already imagined, that doesn't fit very well with Stoicism because we do follow orders very well. So there's not a worry that we're submitting to another will. I can see how an individualist would be worried about that. But here's a line from Epictetus. You have to observe the duty of a soldier and perform everything at the nod of your general, even if possible, divine what he would have done. For there's no comparison between the above mentioned general and this whom you now obey, either in power or excellence of character. That's kind of like a twirly uh, quotation, but I think it's it's not your actual general. But we are very good at following, you know, reasoning that is not ours. It, it, as soon as we recognize it. So we're good at following orders. The problem, the exciting part is we're also good at uh, resisting orders. <laughs> so if I can get to Stockdale, Stockdale, of course, is in a more extreme situation than we are in the office. <laughs> so we have another analogy here. But in a prisoner of war situation, he, as a modern Stoic, says, you cannot beg you cannot make deals, agreements. You have to avoid fear and guilt. That's the most important thing. And so you have to get rid of all of your instincts to compromise. You, you can't meet your guards halfway. And he described his guards as friendly enough people. You have to learn to stand aloof, never give openings for deals, and never level with your adversaries. He says you have to become a slow-moving, cagey prisoner. Um, it's not what we typically associate with Stoicism. So what I want to suggest is that the Stoic answer to how to work under an unsavory boss is going to include these. We all have roles to play. So there's not something uncomfortable about someone having the authority, someone being boss. Not a problem for Stoics. If the job is not pleasant or fair, what did you expect? I'm kind of throwing that out there, but I know we know that of stoicism, but other people have had worse jobs. I mean, it's not something a stoic can't deal with if you're kind of surprised by the difficulty of a job or the tedium of it or, you know, the the disaster of it. Like in Stockdale's case, he, he reassures himself with this question. You know, other people have been through it. What did I expect? You can handle it if others have. And then finally, protect yourself from fear and guilt. So that's what I'm going to try and really focus on. How do we protect ourselves from fear and guilt? And I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, I think that we should do that the way that Stockdale <laughs> handled becoming leader in the prisoner of war camp. So he really is, uh, to me, a model. <laughs> he quits and rebels to maintain self-respect. And the way that he makes sure that's a cooperative enterprise and that they can sleep at night, as he puts it, and they can have satisfaction that they're following some orders is to make a list. So he comes up with the acronym back us and it replaces Eisenhower's suggestion. It's, it's, it's more livable instructions. Just don't bow in public, stay off the air, admit no crimes, never kiss them goodbye. And then us at the end, he says that could be the United States or it could be unity over self. He thought the most important thing was to feel that you were in this together. And so my challenge to us is how we could apply that model to happier situations, office situations, where we, to quote Stockdale, ignore guilt-inducing echoes of hollow edicts. Now that would be the order from Eisenhower. And where we throw out the book and write our own when necessary. To figure this out, I think we'd have to figure out who we're serving, clients, the public, patients, a boss, HR. And then I think we'd have to literally create our own rules for ourselves, share them with others, do the nerdy work of coming up with the norms, articulate them. And then we would be able to fit company rules into ones we endorse or have a policy, a policy, it sounds so nerdy, about how far we're willing to go to support um, policies or practices uh, that we find immoral. So the suggestion is something memorable, something shared, you know, public, as public as possible, and as nerdy as writing down a norm, which I always argue in my little papers is the, the part of practical reasoning that gets glossed over too much by other ethical approaches. 
where if we can articulate something, then we can see it, then we can share it, then we can see how it works, then we can become automatically motivated to do it, then we can give people advice that is sound. And uh, if I haven't said my final thing, but a, a final thing is some of the standard research on poor workplaces that talk about the causes of bad behavior, talk about things a stoic can relate to. So bosses or managers who feel they're beyond criticism, cultures that become very numb. So people just accept deviation from ethical standards. And then justified neglect is also a problem when people don't speak up about ethical breaches because there's, and there's a lot of research in healthcare I've been looking at just for bioethics, where they have long lists of risk factors for a demoralized workplace. And I feel like a stoic could identify and articulate the same exact problems for other workplaces. All right. With that, I thank you. Thank you. And by the way, uh, you can applaud on your screens by this or this or whatever. Do that thing to let people know. They say thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, Jennifer, this is a question for our time, isn't it? We just went through a bunch of stressors in the workplace, you know, by people got sent home and we had lots of controversy and things at work. And of course, it seems like now that in the news, all these all the things that can go wrong in a workplace are elevated to the top of the news all the time. So there's tons of examples of things about, about just a difficult workplace. And if I believe that the T loss of stoicism is eudaimonia, how can I flourish? Then this is it. I want to figure out what the tools are that I could use inside of stoicism so that I can flourish at work in all these various roles that you've described. But I, but I specifically have a work role, even, by the way, if I run my own business and I'm interacting with other people all the time, there's, there's, it's a challenge. Yeah. I mean, I think the Stoics can recognize a real dig dignity in it that, that, that other approaches to work also have, you know, that they, they, they that borrowed from the Stoics. So, you know, I'm a big fan of my kids all get uh, the lowest paying jobs possible landscaper working at Sonic, you know, that type of right. thing. So I think stoicism supportive of that type of, you know, I don't want to call it work ethic because I, it does refer to Weber's, you know, Weber's view is so <laughs> like robust. So we need another term, but that type of discipline and uh, respect for uh, rules and hierarchy, I do think is compatible with uh, our using our own practical rationality. And if we just say the challenge is deciding when it's not, when an instruction is, you know, when it's gone too far, we've kind of given up, haven't we? I mean, I want us to do better than like, well, it depends. And hopefully you'll know when the time comes. I mean, issues like whether we should complain or not, I, I feel like are very live issues. Should a stoic complain? I've gotten personal criticism because I like stoicism and it has been in this form. I thought stoics didn't complain. <laughs> Did you? I don't know if that's true or not, my friend. I think we I think do complain. I think we do complain. I'm going to take this first question because I think this is a this is a solid foundational question. And someone asks, and I can't pronounce this name, but it's something. Ray, is there solid evidence or argument that virtue leads to eudaimonia? Is there any benefit at all at acting with virtue? And of course, this is Stoics versus Aristotle kind of a question here. Yeah, I mean, I get to answer. I, I have been working on this, and unfortunately, I have not found any such evidence. And I've I went pretty deep in with behavioral science. I've been looking at George Ainsley's work on motivation. I like it at that type of level. And, you know, my my take is just they they cannot have not yet operationalized that form of happiness. Not that they won't. And I know they're operationalizing and starting to test and do interventions to test for evidence of uh, phronesis or practical rationality. But I'm pretty comfortable that they haven't yet found the evidence we need if we need empirical evidence that you can imagine why. I mean, it just gets so circular. I mean, the psychologists will not agree with us. Sure. On is it. Behavioral scientists will not even believe ethics exists. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and for uh, for me anyway, this is like, this is a thing I am choosing to believe and I'm looking for evidence in the world that this works. And so far it's kind of good enough for me. I'm, I'm just running the experiment on Phil is what I'm doing. Experiments. That's right. That right. those should not be discounted. 